Okay, just to recap on where we've got to um, so far, we started with the idea of um, feral children and a discussion of nurture versus nature in order to establish that from the point of view of sociology, that society, if you like, creates what we are to be human. We talked about how and breaking down what society and culture is with the idea that culture as defined as a way of life is made up of norms, values, status and role. That is expected patterns of behavior. That is where we rank in society and what role such as father, mother, etc., we take up within that. Um, values, something that society finds worthwhile, informs these other three and others I could mention like rituals and ceremonies, which become part of culture. Um, it is said that as Brits, we value politeness. So the thing we find worthwhile is politeness, which is informed or informs the norm or expected behavior of queuing. Uh, you could say the value, we value modesty, so we will dress well. You, we, you could say as a society, we value entrepreneurs, businessmen, which is why they get paid so much and they're a high status. Uh, you could say the same for doctors, et cetera. Um, and you can see the role, the fatherhood role, is made up of social expectations of behavior, how to do that job. Um, that culture, um, when we, we talked about the feral children, we started talking about Mowgli and Jungle Book as a fictional character, and we looked at specific examples. Mowgli, or one of these other feral children that we spoke about, would need to be socialized to be taught culture, our way of life, in order to integrate into broader society. Social institutions, such as the family, education, mass media, the criminal justice system, and so on, socialize us. When we are brought up in the family, we learn right from wrong, we know how to behave and how not to behave. That's reinforced and given a more universal slant, when we go into education, that is also echoed in the world of work and reinforced by the mass media. Here, sociologists by and large agree. Then we get to a point of division between perspectives in sociology. On the one hand, we have structure, and on the other, we have agency. These are ends of a scale, they are extremes. No one is purely structure and no one is purely agency. Functionalists are a structural approach in that they see culture as being done to us as individuals with little mediation so that um, norms, values, status and roles create conformity. Now, to functionalists, this is a good thing, and it is something that we agree upon or is important for society because they are terrified of disruption or dysfunction or societal breakdown. They're all about maintaining social solidarity, that is the working together and being as one. They're all for uh, equilibrium in society so everyone knows their place and the whole system functions well. They believe in two key concepts, value consensus, that we all agree on a core set of societal values that informs how we behave, how we are have an attitude to rank and our social role, that we all buy into the same set of values. The body analogy is the idea that the society, our society, is like a body and that the social institutions in our society act like organs in a body. That is, um, they pump round norm, values, status in roles to ensure that we um, 
all know the rules, that we're all singing from the same hymn book, as it were. Um, so that uh, when we are young, what it is to be a girl is taught through the family so that the social expectation, the norms of behavior of genders are given to us. So we know how to behave, how we, we interact. And functionalists talk about the female role being one of caring, nurturing, the domestic role, and the male role being one of competition, work, et cetera. And they see very traditional roles and they see rigidity in norms, values, and status. Um, so that's functionalism. They are consensus, consensus theory because they believe we all agree and that this is all good for us. It is fair, it is right, it is how it should be. Marxists believe pretty much the same except one massive major difference that it is unfair, it is not agreed, it is imposed upon us through socialization. Their key concept of ideology is very similar to the idea of value consensus in that it says these, this is a, the, the name for the norms, values, status, roles, our culture. However, Marxists see these things running for the benefit of the rich and the detriment of the poor. The bourgeoisie, the rich, own the means of production, not only in terms of producing food and material, but also producing culture. If you look at the ownership of the mass media, for instance, you can see it is in a very few hands. It is, according to Marxists, operating for the benefit of the rich, reinforcing ideas that benefit the rich. Um, if I could give you an example, one of the uh, cultural um, uh, norms or ideas that are prevalent in our society is that if you work hard and you have talent, you will go do well in school. Those grades in school will take you to a university course. That university course, the same application of talent and um, hard work is applied, will get you a high status, well-paid job. Marxists argue that this is actually an idea that benefits the rich. Because the reality is, if you're born into priv priv privilege, you're likely to die into privilege. There is little social mobility, movement up and down between groups. If it was true that we lived in a meritocracy, that we were each where we were in society by merit, there would be a lot of movement up and down. There is not. The rich people stay at the top, and by and large, the rest of us stay at the bottom. So that there is this idea of social mobility is a myth. This idea of meritocracy is a myth put about by those evil capitalist bourgeoisie in order for the likes of us to work really hard for them to benefit them and to have little benefit for us. The idea of superstructure is similar to the body analogy, but it looks at talking about those social institution as perpetrating the con on the rest of us. Superstructure puts forward the ideas of capitalist ideology, giving, um, covering the true reality of our society, which is culture and the economy are as one and that the means of production and the relationship to the means of production, i.e. those that have and those that have not, is the reality underneath. Likewise, um, and so um, Marxists are called a um, conflict theory. That means that they believe society is in conflict rather than in unison or working by consensus. It is imposed by the, the one group on top of the other. But feminists are also a conflict um, theory in that they see the conflict between men and women as key to the running of our society. They see culture as patriarchal. That's their key structural concept, which is that the norms, values, status and role of our society are for the benefit of men and not to the detriment of women. Um, 
talks about sex typing. So this idea of uh, uh, gender stereotypes, which push women towards low pay, uh, insecure work, um, and men towards the higher restaurants. And patriarchy would explain how and why men dominate the better paid positions and women dominate uh, those that live in poverty or, or in low paid work. Okay, so that's the structural side. On the agency side, and again, I need to emphasize that this is two ends of the, of the scale. We talk about a different approach. It sees this large scale approach as neglecting, not seeing the true reality. And this is because unlike the structurists, they do not see norms, values, status, and role as fixed, but fluid. And they're fluid because in social situations, the norms, values, status, and roles, our cultures operate as a stock of interpretations, which we negotiate meaning from. And what I mean by that is this, as a father, I know what I'm meant to be. However, through my personal experience, being brought up in a family and the interaction with others, particularly other fam fathers, I negotiate, I mediate the norms and values of society. And so therefore, um, each time these norms and values and status meet a social situation, they change and will vary, which would suggest that culture varies. Moving on to postmodernism, the last thing that we're going to look at today, I won't say too much about it now, but what it does is postmodernism is a denial of structure. You could call it post-structure, meaning after structure, after modernity. And what it denies completely is this idea of universal ways of looking at things. Okay, thank you for that.